Um, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to the Paul Mellon Centre in the room and online. My name is Christina Faraday. I'm a research fellow at Gonville and Keys College in Cambridge and an erstwhile um, postdoctoral fellow of the Paul Mellon Centre. And I specialise in the art and ideas of the Tudor period. Uh, and it's my honour to be the convener of this summer public event series, Tudors Now! Exclamation mark, the exclamation mark we're very fond of. Um, a selection of discussions, tours and workshops exploring the current state of research in Tudor art history and culture. For a long time, the Tudors have been on the fringes of mainstream art history. There's been a focus on Reformation upheavals, which has meant that for a while it was believed there was very little art in Tudor England except portraits. And what art there was has been deemed relatively unsophisticated in technique and in intellectual appeal. But more recently, scholars, including uh, those with me here today, have started to broaden our understanding of Tudor art, revealing hitherto neglected genres and examples, and improving our understanding of artistic and intellectual climates um, that produced them. So Tudors Now is an attempt to capture the state of the field, taking stock of what's been achieved over the last few decades, and opening paths for further discussion in the future. So our first event brings together three scholars of the Tudor period who are helping to broaden our understanding of what Tudor art was and what it could do. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tara Hamling, a reader in early modern studies in the Department of History at the University of Birmingham. Her research focuses on the visual arts and material culture of early modern England with a particular interest in religious imagery, decoration and domestic context. She's the author of Decorating the Godly Household, Religious Art in Post-Reformation Britain. And with Catherine Richardson, she also wrote A Day at Home in Early Modern England, Material Culture and Domestic Life, 1500-1700, both with Yale University Press. And she's currently an investigator on the Arts and Humanities Research Council-funded project, The Cultural Lives of the Middling Sort, Writing and Material Culture, 1560-1660. Also with us this evening is Helen Hackett, Professor of English Literature at University College London, specialising in Shakespeare, Renaissance literature, women's writing and feminist criticism. She is interested in the intersections between literature, art and history in the early modern period and in intercultural encounters. Her latest book, The Elizabethan Mind, published with Yale University Press, last year, explores competing and conflicting ideas of the mind in the late 16th century and how these generated the extraordinary literary creativity of the period. And there are flyers um, on your seats for those of you in the room. And if you're online, you can ha achieve the discount um, by putting ELIZA in capital letters into the checkout at Yale University Press. Finally, we also have Larry Lynn, a fashion historian and author, currently head of exhibitions at the National Museum of Wales and a trustee of the Royal School of Needlework. She has previously been an assistant curator at the V&A and the curator of royal ceremonial dress at the historic royal palaces. Uh, she's the author of several monographs, including Tudor Fashion, which won the Historians of British Art Prize, and Tudor Textiles. And she's also the curator of several major exhibitions, including The Lost Dress of Elizabeth I at Hampton Court Palace in 2019. And she's recently appeared on BBC Two's Art That Made Us and BBC One's Elizabeth Fashioning a Monarch. So welcome to Making the Tudors. Each speaker will present an object of particular interest for about five to ten minutes, and then we will come together for a discussion before opening up to the floor uh, here and online for further questions and discussion. And um, if mention of any of those books has piqued your interest, they are also all available in the Paul Mellon Centre Library downstairs. So thank you. And uh, first up is Tara Hamling. Great. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks so much to Christina for organising this event. I'm very excited to be here and celebrate Tudors now! Exclamation mark. Um, so, uh, Christina's been very strict with us. We're only allowed five to ten minutes to just introduce our object, a particular object, and then we're going to hopefully tease out some of the issues that these objects raise in discussion. Okay, so this is, is the object now um, that I'm going to be talking about, as it appears now um, in... Uh, a, a place called the White Swan Inn in Stratford-upon-Avon, the hometown of Shakespeare, as you'll know. 
Um, they're in a fragmentary state, uh, as you can see, and behind glass um, to protect them uh, and what remains of them. Um, it, it's now a, a, a hotel and a pub and in the front room, so it's possible to go in and see them. But it's very, very difficult to make out the detail of the wall paintings. So I do have uh, these um, drawings that were made some, some time ago and are in the V&A's collection, the Victorian Albert collection. But I'm going to use this pictorial um, representation of the wall paintings to talk through what we can see within them. Um, so the White Swan was operating as an inn as early as 1560 in Stratford, kind of important uh, landmark in the town, um, possibly even earlier. And based on the style of the clothing worn in the paintings, um, in, uh, uh, the painted characters, the paintings probably date from uh, the 1580s or the 90s. So they're Elizabethan in date, uh, coinciding with the time that Shakespeare would have been uh, just, just leaving the town to come to, come to London. So two sections of wall painting remain on one wall, um, on the left here, as you can see. Um, and it's on the ground floor, as I say, in the street-facing room. Um, but originally, the scheme would have extended around all four walls. And that's one of the things I'd like to talk more about in questions, is modes of viewing, sort of moving around spaces and, and looking at uh, uh, Tudor art. The larger section is, is quite large. It's nine foot, over nine foot wide and three foot um, in, 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 in height. Um, and the area underneath, as you can see, is blank. Uh, and it's probably likely there was some kind of settled, some kind of fixed furniture, sort of built in benches underneath. The outer edges, as you can see, are painted with this amazing kind of foliage and large flowers, much larger than the painted scenes. Um, and between these floral motifs in this first section are two pictorial scenes. They're depicted within classical columns, as if you're sort of looking through um, them onto a sort of colonnade or, or, or loggia. It's like you're in a loggia looking out. Um, these scenes show two moments from the story from the Apocrypha, um, the biblical Apocrypha, and it's the story of Tobit. So this well-known story describes the journey of the blind Tobit's son, Tobias, to another town, and he's accompanied by the angel Raphael in disguise. Um, along the way, the angel advises Tobias to keep the innards of a fish that he catches from the uh, river um, on arrival in the town. The burnt heart of the fish is used to exercise a demon from a young woman called Sarah so that Tobias is able to marry her. The couple return to Tobit, the father, and use the gall of the fish to cure Tobit's blindness. So the essential story here is that through faith, God redeems his chosen people. I'm interested in how <coughs> storytelling works through Tudor art. So that's what I'd like to tease out. How do, how do, how's that story uh, conveyed in, in the uh, paintings as we can see them? So, as you can see, the first scene shows Tobit and his wife sending um, his, their son off with this other figure, which we presume to be Raphael. Although uh, Raphael is sort of half hidden by these sort of green drapes, these green hangings uh, that sort of suggest an interior space. Next to this, the next scene along, which is in, in quite poor condition, it's a bit difficult to make out, but you can see the townscape in the background. So there's a scene of you know, Tobias and uh, Raphael setting off into, into this landscape. And I think what's interesting is that there's a notable difference. So though the two scenes are next to each other, you sort of think that there's a linear mode of viewing, they actually look quite different. Um, the figures are different in scale. You've moved from an interior setting to an exterior setting um, with lots of kind of foreground, background, and the, and the figures sort of moving through the space. So they evoke that kind of those different moments in time and space. And, and the second scene does lack the drapery of the first. And then um, at the top, you can see there's just these little bits of text, which again spell out the kind of gist of the narrative. They're not so much telling the story as just sort of mentioning the key moments in it. Um, and again, we've got these flowering plants that sort of guide, guide us along to the next section. So there's a wall post, which you can just see on the far right of this first um, slide here. And that then opens out into the third scene that survives um, from uh, uh, what would have been a larger scheme, as I said. Um, and this, this section is interesting because it extends down. It's no longer looking out through these columns into a loggia. It sort of moves out of the space a little bit. Um, and it kind of get, has that sense of movement. Here we see the river uh, uh, coming down and uh, Tobias and, and Raphael catching the big fish. 
So no other painting survives, but it's almost certain... Is that my eight minutes? OK. Almost certain that other scenes kind of continued around the room, but not necessarily a complete narrative. Um, and I say that because... The broadside ballad on the far right there also recounts the story of Tobit and Tobias and the Angel, um, but it tells the story with these woodcuts and only four scenes are represented. Um, so it jumps, it kind of just picks out the key moments from the story. And it's kind of expected that the, the, the viewer the, the, will understand exactly how they slot into the wider narrative. Um, so these four woodcuts include the first two scenes in the wall painting, um, so the setting off of, of, of uh, Tobias and the catching of the fish, and then the marriage of Tobias and Sarah, the happy sort of resolution of the story, and then the healing of the father Tobit's blindness as well. So you can see how it jumps a lot of the narrative. So this is getting to my point. The images in print and paint then do not tell the story so much as evoke it. The surviving scenes, they, they lack the detailed portrayal of action, and they rely on prior knowledge of the story to recognize these various significant moments in, in the arc, the story arc. So setting off on the journey, catching the fish, arriving, using the fish to affect happy union, and using the fish to uh, return uh, to the family and, again, uh, affect another heal, healing. So this, these paintings, I think, express in very efficient manner the core themes of divine protection and deliverance. It shares these themes with other popular um, Old Testament stories, uh, tales of young men leaving the security of family and experiencing adversity before returning home. So there are examples such as, you know, the story of the prodigal son, which features in wall paintings uh, in a, a house in Hertfordshire, and the story of Joseph, originally depicted in a house in, the high, in Widemarsh Street of Hereford. So these are middling sort houses, they're not grand uh, elite spaces. So the story of Tobias also had the added value of special relevance for travellers, because the angel Raphael, who accompanies Tobias on his journey, acts to ensure his safety and ultimately to restore the sight of his father. The providential care of a young traveller is a highly appropriate subject for decoration in an inn. The emphasis on landscape, if I go back one second, across these paintings and the uh, cityscapes and the rolling countryside as well as the oversized floral motifs all serve to evoke a sense of travel and movement even where the pictorial style is somewhat static. The story also uh, intersects with popular providentialism where huge fish, for example, on the left here, uh, another broadside ballad, were interpreted as divine portents. So here, uh, a printed account of monstrous fishes 27 feet long caught in the river a mile from Ipswich in 1568 ends with the lesson, and this you must see, the perfect and true description of these strange fishes, wherein is to be noted the strange and marvellous handiworks of the Lord, blessed be God in all his gifts." So in the space of an inn where ballads were displayed and sung, these allied forms of visual and oral culture come together in a rich layering of themes and motifs. Viewing this kind of painted decoration then, if I go back again and to how it is now, therefore required mobile maneuvering of the mind and creative responses to its prompts. The culture of early modern England demanded intellectual and aesthetic agility in making connections between different media and genres, drawing allusions between different stories, places and materials from theological questions interrogated in sermons to the painted, painted surfaces of social spaces like inns. Okay, thanks for now. Hello everyone, I'm Helen Hackett. Um, my chosen object is a page from an Elizabethan manuscript in the Horton Library in Harvard. Uh, there it is. The manuscript is a miscellany. Uh, that means it's a kind of personal scrapbook of diverse materials, including poems, prose, and drawings. And they're mostly religious in theme. They include allegorical materials, Protestant polemic, and chronicle entries. And the main compiler of this manuscript was a man with the wonderful name of Stephen Batman, 
Um, he was a Church of England clergyman. He published various religious and didactic works and also a very widely used encyclopedic work called Batman Upon Bartolome. And he also collected ancient books and manuscripts and was known as a limner, which is relevant to this item. A limner was a practitioner of the kind of detailed painting that was used in making portrait miniatures. So we can date this miscellany to the early 1580s, partly because it contains dated chronicle entries and partly because we know Batman died in 1584. And it seems to be related to a printed work by Batman uh, published in 1581 called The Doom Warning All Men to Judgment. Uh, both that and the manuscript contain uh, lots of interest in prodigies, apocalyptic uh, omens. There's a strong sense throughout this manuscript that England is in peril. The page I'm interested in, uh, as you saw, contains a drawing and some verses. I'm going to zoom in here on the drawing. And I hope you can see it's an image of a man and woman. They're posing as if for a portrait of a respectable married couple. But if you look closely, you can see that in the upper parts of their heads, there are lots of tiny figures representing their secret thoughts. And you should have found on your seat uh, a text handout of the accompanying verses which explain what's going on in the image. So if you can uh, get hold of that and have a look at line nine, for instance, Batman writes there, these faces deformed bids England beware. And he says in line 10 that the man personifies upstart gentility, oppressing clergy for Romish Liberty. So in other words, these are social climbers, and not only that, they're also Catholics. And that's confirmed, um, you probably can't see it very well, but there's a tiny figure above the man's ear, which is actually a priest saying mass. So that confirms that he's a Catholic. And remember, I mentioned that Batman was a Church of England clergyman, so of course he's hostile to Catholics. In line 12, he says, the man's mind is fraught with treasons. So we can see in his mind ships, soldiers fighting, we can see a town on fire. And because this is a manuscript from the early 1580s, it's very much from the time of the build-up of anxiety, fear of a Spanish naval invasion, which of course would materialize in 1588 as the Spanish Armada. Batman also explains the figures on the left of the man's head. Uh, he says in line 14 of the verses, the devil in his ear, you can perhaps see the little horned figure of the devil in his ear, lets discord go free. So the figure he's letting down is discord. Flattery holds will who doth not see. So will is the horse down here. Uh, a horse was a traditional representation of will, which needs to be bridled. Uh, as for the female figure on the right, line 19 explains that her speech is deceit. So that's represented by a serpent's head with a forked tongue just poking out between her lips. Um, Batman says that her diet is adultery. On the right, we can see a couple just above her shoulder in a four-poster bed uh, having sex. And according to line 20, on her eyebrows are spoil of lordships to maintain prodigality. Uh, presumably, Batman means by that misappropriated estates, which are represented by houses and trees uh, maintaining her wealth. And from line 24, Batman sums up what these figures represent in a series of antitheses. Under the color of amity, treason. Under the show of activity, popery. Outward countenance, love. Inward, dissimulation. And all of this relates to intensive Elizabethan debates about whether the inner character could be read from the face. Batman discussed this in Batman Upon Bartolome, that encyclopedic work of his that I mentioned earlier. There he asserted that in the head all the wits be seen, and therefore in a manner it presenteth the person of the soul that counselleth and ruleth the body. And he proceeded, still in Batman upon Bartolome, to discuss the eyes, the eyebrows, and the forehead, and how all of these indicated, in their outward form, the inner state of the mind. For example, he writes, brows have a virtue hid that showeth outward the passions of the soul. You didn't know your eyebrows could be read, did you? But they can, apparently. As saith Aristotle. 
the forehead showeth outward the imagination and disposition of the thought, and so on. Now that word imagination that he uses there, you can read the imagination from the forehead, that's crucial, I think, and that had different connotations for the Elizabethans than it does for us. Also in Batman upon Bartolome, Batman sends, sets out the standard 16th century explanation of the structure of the brain, which is that the imagination was at the front where it made mental pictures. So he could think of Batman's drawing as revealing the imaginations of the two figures. These mental pictures originated either from sense impressions of the outside world or from the imagination's own resources, in which case the imagination was then called fantasy. It passed these images to reason in the middle part of the brain for evaluation, and then they were passed to memory at the back of the brain for storage. And this theory of the mind meant that mental functioning was conceptualized in highly visual terms. Basically, all thoughts originated as images created by the imagination. But it also meant that the imagination was regarded as deeply unreliable. Its sense impressions of the material world could be distorted by various factors, while the image, images it generated itself when it was acting as fantasy had no basis in reality. And all these negative associations led to the imagination being associated with both religious and political transgression and subversion. The book of Genesis taught that the imagination of man's heart is evil, even from his youth. And this was picked up by many Protestant theologians, including William Perkins, who preached on this text. He said that man's imagination stands in thoughts, the understanding deviseth by thinking, and these thoughts of the imagination are all naturally wicked. Meanwhile, the law defined treason as to compass or imagine the death of the monarch. William Lambard, in a conversation with Elizabeth I about the Essex Rebellion, referred to it as such a wicked imagination. So Batman's drawing is showing us just such wicked imaginations in the minds of his subjects, thoughts which are sinful and treasonous. Protestants especially associated Catholics with the deceptive concealment of thoughts. In 1580-81, so around the time Batman's making this manuscript, Edmund Campion and other Jesuits were in England pursuing their underground mission, and there was increasing alarm amongst Protestants about the controversial Catholic practices of equivocation and mental reservation. Uh, that meant not fully answering incriminating questions, silently reserving the full truth in your mind. For Catholics, this was a legitimate and necessary form of self-preservation, but for Protestants, it was seen as duplicitous, treasonous, and very alarming. Um, I'll just mention briefly another interesting point about Batman's drawing, that it seems to draw on portraits of Elizabeth's predecessor, her sister Mary I, and her husband, Philip II of Spain. Here are two typical portraits of Philip and Mary from the collection of the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, these were widely reproduced, and if I put them next to Batman's drawing, you can see how very similar they are. Now, clearly, you know, Batman tells us in his verses that his subjects are upstart gentry. They're not Philip and Mary, they're middle class. Uh, but it's so interesting that for a kind of template, an archetype of Catholic wickedness and duplicity, he turns to the most recent Catholic king and queen. I'll just sum up very briefly some key features of Batman's drawing. It's accompanied by verses. This kind of interaction between image and word is typical of Elizabethan Protestant culture, as we saw also in Tara's presentation, alongside the idea that images have allegorical meanings and that they require interpretation. Images are there to be read. Secondly, Batman's participating in a general Elizabethan preoccupation with how thoughts can be represented. This generated much of their literary creativity, but here we see it producing a visual representation of thoughts as well. And this relates to Elizabethan ideas about the imagination, that all thought began as a process of visualization, but that this could be unreliable and morally compromised. 
All of this is in the context of debates about whether the inner nature of the mind could be read from outward signs, and these were, as I've said, especially acute in the case of Catholics, who were becoming notorious for concealing secret thoughts. So it seems to me that Batman's drawing offers us lots to consider in terms of the thinking behind visual images in the Tudor period. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Larry Lynn, and this is the Bacton altar cloth, um, which is the object I'm going to speak to you about. So, my relationship with the Bacton altar cloth uh, began when I was researching for my book, Tudor Fashion, published by Yale and available in all good bookshops, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at the time, I was the curator of the Royal Ceremonial Dress Collection for Historic Royal Palaces, and it was usually my sad duty to inform inquirers that I'm very sorry, you can't come and see the wardrobe of Anne Boleyn or Elizabeth I because it just doesn't survive. So I was following a Google rabbit hole, um, as one does um, over lunch while eating a sandwich, and happened upon a photo of this altar cloth hanging in the small church of St. Faith's in Baxton, Herefordshire. And I thought to myself, well, that looks a little bit 1590s, so I better go and have a look at it. So I did. Um, I visited the church. I was met by the church warden and other parishioners. And I immediately knew that I was looking at something very special indeed. So prior to working at Historic Royal Palaces, I had spent 10 years working at the V&A, where it was my privilege to get out objects of textiles and fashion for researchers and students. And I had never seen embroidery of this quality um, from that period anyway. What I saw and what you can see here was a T-shaped altar cloth. It's made uh, of professionally um, embroidered floral motifs wrought in gold, silk, and silver thread. They're embroidered directly through the cloth of silver, which is a white ribbed silk woven with silver bullion in it. Um, this in itself makes it incredibly valuable. Um, cloth of silver was, of course, reserved by sumptuary law in the Tudor period to the highest levels of royalty, um, or at the very um, top to the earls and countesses. Um, and the amount of silver in this altar cloth equates to a very, very nice house during the 16th century. So what is it doing in Bacton? These primary, primary floral motifs that you can see are very helpful. Uh, they date stylistically to the very end of the 16th century. Any later and they start to develop this sort of scrolling look that look a little bit more Jacobean in style. Uh, but I had never seen um, embroidery of this, style, of this quality um, before. Um, these primary floral motifs are further embellished with motifs. You can see there of birds, butterflies, a hunting scene, animals, boats, and sea monsters, um, which loomed large in the popular imagination um, of the time. And these are done by domestic embroiderers, not professional embroiderers. So that's going to be your nobility, your ladies, um, you know, following a, a genteel pastime. Two things made this even more intriguing. One um, is that you can see from the patterns here, uh, perhaps the, the way that the, the patterns form, that um, this wasn't made as an altar cloth. It used to be something else before it was an altar cloth. And secondly, Bacton is the birthplace of one Blanche Parry one of Elizabeth I's closest servants and confidants. Blanche was with Elizabeth from cradle almost to grave. And even though she wasn't a lady, Elizabeth treasured her and gave her gifts from her own wardrobe. So the cogs start turning, could this be, dot, dot, dot. So I asked to borrow this and to take it to Hampton Court Palace for research and conservation, which were the, the parish were very helpful and happy to facilitate, because they'd always known it was special. Um, and they'd always made the link between it and Elizabeth, or at least with Bla Blanche. And they had conserved and framed it themselves at their own expense in 1909. And it was this conservation that saved it, probably preserving it for us. It had received some attention before, of course. Janet Arnold um, had uh, noted it for her uh, magnificent book, The Queen's Wardrobe Unlocked. And it also received some further documentation in the early 20th century. Um, 
But perhaps Janet Arnold didn't do what I did, which was to climb up into the pews and notice that just under the frame, there was evidence of some pattern cutting um, tucked away, which suggested that it might be cut from a dress. So we began about a thousand hours of conservation and research on the cloth itself. A fantastic intern working for me recognised the little bear, which you can see sort of in the top right quarter. Um, she recognised it immediately um, as a little bear from a print book by Nicholas de Bruin called Four-Legged Animals from 1494. And the most likely inspiration for the floral motifs um, were in a pattern book, La Clef des Champs, that's the key to the fields, by Jacques Lemoyne from 1586, whose patron was Lady Mary Sidney and whose preface said it should be used for silver work, gold work and embroidery. My colleagues in the textile conservation studio unpicked the cloth from the 1909 frame and unstitched the threads that had kept it on its mounting board. Through the conservation, um, though the cons conservation had saved it back then, they'd put it onto cotton, which was warping and moving in different ways from the silk. So really we got to it and saved it uh, because it was starting to buckle. And the team carefully reattached it to a specially dyed <coughs> conservation silk backing it with threads as thin as a human hair. But in the process, the original colours were revealed on the back, and while the silver on the front glimmers and glitters, the colours on the back were uh, vivid. So we had vibrant bright yellows, vivid blues, bold reds, and it was actually quite emotional to see those colours um, for the first time in so many uh, years. I invited lots of experts to come and see it. Thank you, Helen, who came and shared expertise. And every time we saw it, uh, more and more evidence uh, that we were looking at something made for the very highest level of customer emerged. Here we had blue indigo dye from India. We had cochineal red from Mexico. So evidence of tangible global trade at huge expense. The stitches were worked through the cloth itself rather than being applied like applique slips. And we discovered that this was without parallel anywhere in the world. So what we're looking at is a virtuoso piece. It's a master showing off basically. And of course, we have similarity here in the pattern to the bodice um, that the Queen herself is wearing in the rainbow portrait from Hatfield House. Now, I've spent many hours staring at this and the rainbow portrait together to see if I can match them up. Well, they don't uh, match up, but we do know that they both date to around 1600. And we do know that around this time, Elizabeth was very sensitive about her image and her dignity. She didn't really like to have women at court and retained only a handful of ladies and maids of honour who she required to dress much more modestly than her. In fact, we have a story from an early 17th century account that told of how one Mistress Howard was starting to wear clothes or a little bit uh, too nice. And so the Queen went into her chamber and donned Mistress Howard's clothes. Uh, Mistress Howard was a little bit shorter than the Queen, so the Queen came out wearing it and challenged the assembled company to say, how do I look? It, her clothes weren't fitting. So, uh, so... Uh, they had to fess up and the Queen basically said well if it is not becoming on me then I'm sure it would not be becoming on Mistress Howard or something to that effect. I imagine that must have been pretty terrifying if this is true. So of course this is a very nice, probably apocryphal, nice little anecdote but it does summarise some facts which we know to be true and aptly demonstrates that the Bax and Alter cloth, especially seen through the lens of the rainbow portrait, is fit for a Queen. And that was a very jealously guarded state. So, the altar cloth conserved and remounted formed the focus of the exhibition, The Lost Dress at Hampton Court, alongside contemporary embroidery slips, books by Jacques Lemoyne and Nicholas de Bruin, and of course, the rainbow portrait. Now, the lighting and the context of that exhibition was illuminating, um, no pun intended, actually. Um, in the damask-lined room and the low lighting of Hampton Court, the altar cloth absolutely popped. The light picked up all the detail of the embroidery and the silver. It absolutely <coughs> glittered. And here, perhaps, we have the defining piece of evidence for me that we're looking at an elite um, garment um, here in a court where most people were dressed in wool and velvets that absorbed the light, even fine silks. Whoever was adorned in something like this would have stood out. They would have been ethereal and magnificent. And to be crass, it's Tudor high-vis, basically. 
And of course, the rainbow portrait, so replete with symbolism, almost every inch of that portrait is covered in textiles. And actually, even the, the picture that symbolizes, um, you know, that represents our talk today um, is absolutely replete with textiles, demonstrating the worth of textiles to the Tudor mindset. Among the symbolism, flowers aren't mere decoration. They are derived from print books, rare and valuable. They demonstrate, of course, man's classification of and mastery over the natural world. They demonstrate knowledge and women's access to it, which we must consider. It's a fantastic object. It's very close to my heart, and it's full of amazing access points to the long Tudor century. So hopefully, it's a good platform for us to uh, kick off our discussion. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for those three um, fantastic objects to kick us off. Um, so I thought it would be nice if we could use those as a starting point for a broader discussion about the, the state of the field Tudors now and you know what we're learning and what we maybe still have to learn. Um, so I wonder if we could perhaps start by taking stock and um, if you'd like to talk about how our perception of the Tudor art landscape has changed in recent years. Who'd like to go first? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start. Yeah. Um, I think... One thing I'm struck by just thinking about all the objects that we were talking about is I think they were all produced um, to some degree collaboratively, probably. Am I right? Yeah, yes. Sure. And I think that's something we've thought about a lot more recently. So I think perhaps in the past we used to think much more in terms of who is the artist, particularly when we thought about portraits. Who is the artist? You know, we wanted a kind of single maker and a single mind who created this artefact. And of course, there are lots of analogies there with literature where we tend to want to look for a single author or we want a great mind like Shakespeare. We want to think of them as creating something entirely on their own. And I think both in literature and the visual arts, we've come to understand, well, that's not really how it worked. Um, in, in Shakespeare's case, he was working in the Playhouse, obviously in collaboration with actors and with other workers in the Playhouse producing the plays. The, the object I was talking about, I said the main compiler of it was Stephen Batman, but actually other members of the family contributed to that miscellany. That's often the case. That's often a place where we find women writing and circulating writings is in miscellanies like that. And I think in the visual arts too, we're coming to understand how things like funerary monuments, uh, buildings, various kinds of structure, uh, women might have a role as what's been called uh, Peter Davidson and Jane Stevenson use a really useful form of divisor. That a woman might not literally be the person who hews the stone to make the funeral monument and who carves the inscription on it, but she might have uh, discussed what kind of statue she wanted on it, what kind of inscription she wanted on it. She might have written, actually, a poem to go on the monument. And so there's a kind of collaborative process going on, and that in itself is interesting, but also it gives more opportunities to women to get involved in artistic production. Absolutely. I think definitely questions being raised about our conception of authorship, but I think also originality. I mean, you know, Tara, your object's based on print culture, and that's not um, something that's seen as a, a fault in the artist. It's just, it's pretty much all domestic decoration, isn't it, that we know, that we can sort of trace usually to a print source, would you say? I mean, maybe there's more originality there, but... Yeah, but it's not the slavish copy no. of printed sources, and that's the important point. So I think one of the ways in which we might think about art in England in this period is around the balance of convention and invention. Mm. Um, so the use of printed sources is a really good example of that. You know, there's a playing around with a particular printed source that may or may not be recognised, embedded within interior decoration. If you get the reference, you're in the know, but it doesn't matter if you don't. But, you know, it's not a question of just having it exactly as is in the printed source. It's very often adapted. Sometimes different cartouches are, and surrounds are incorporated from other prints. So... Again, I think that kind of element of invention was appreciated, even though there is, a, and again, it's one of the things that sort of runs Tudor art down is that kind of sense that, oh, but it's just reliant on printed sources. I think we need to move away from um, that assumption. That's necessarily a bad thing in the Tudor mindset. That's, that's kind of playing around. That's, that's actually kind of showing your knowledge and indeed your kind of oftentimes continental um, exposure to continental sources as well. Right, exactly, in places we wouldn't necessarily expect them. And I think the word, I mean, even the word invent comes from Latin invenire, which is to find as much as it is to invent in the sense that we know. So I think, you know, new things being built out of the old and 
Um, Ilari, I wondered if you wanted to say anything about that kind of collaborative process with the combination in your back to Nautical Club. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's a few things that spring to mind as we're talking, and one of those was um, thinking about the, uh, you know, the idea of intention um, and patronage as well. It, I was thinking about Lady Mary Sidney as the, the patron of La Clef de Champ, um, and how she had intended it. I, I think you know, there's a lot of work recently that shows you know, the, the intention for embroidery pattern books and print books to be sources of knowledge for women, um, and that actually embroidery was intended as an intellectual um, activity, rather, you know, not just a kind of genteel pastime. So I think there's there's definitely something to be explored there around the the, the role of the patron um, and their intention and their collaboration in the work. But absolutely, I mean, you know, a, a work. A, you know, a, a piece like the Baxton Altar Cloth would certainly have been the work of many, many hands um, and many different sources, so professional, domestic. Um, but, you know, also I think what we're seeing in some later Elizabethan embroidery is also the intention, there's a world of women that's happening here, there's a codified language as well, which is really interesting and perhaps we perhaps a bit We'll, we'll get into that in a bit, perhaps a bit too broad a, <laughs> a, a thing to start with. Fantastic, absolutely. I, I mean, so that's a sort of concept that perhaps we're now paying a bit more attention to um, in scholarship. But I wonder if there are also changes in terms of even the genres that we're looking at and the kinds of art. Um, Tara, you're nodding. <laughs> <laughs> so... When I started out, I would uh, notice things that were sort of hiding in plain sight mm. uh, as we go to kind of country houses and look around uh, Elizabethan Jacobean houses. And, you know, I was looking at the overmantles where I noticed that the, the guided tours were sort of directing you more to the state portraits or, you know, the, the grand portraits. So they, they'd kind of been there. They'd always been there. They'd been left alone, but they'd kind of fallen out of favour. They'd been neglected. They were seen as awkward, crude. These are all words that... Uh, are used to describe them in some of the early uh, accounts. Um, but again, where does that kind of language of judgment come from? What, what are we comparing this work to? And why do we see it as inferior? Are we comparing the decorative arts to the fine arts and therefore it's a lesser art form? Or are we comparing the decorative arts of England to the decorative arts of the continent and therefore it's lesser and less quality than the work there? Do those comparisons matter in a, in a Tudor context? Would early modern people have worried about those questions of fine versus decorative or, you know, what, you know the, the kind of terms of crude or, you know, are these even terms that were used at the time? So I think one of the huge advances is thinking about artworks in different places, not in churches, not necessarily at court, although your example brings them together in a fascinating way, but, you know, also in perhaps lesser houses, um, in, as I say, inns and public spaces. Um, and again, let's just abandon some of those old frameworks of, uh, of, of judgment. Alary, you're, you're yeah, nodding away. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm <laughs> nodding vigorously. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think what we're doing, is, you know, we're, what, or rather what... Um, scholarship perhaps has done for a long time, which is changing now, is looking at Tudor art through a hierarchy that is more modern and contemporary. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, Hans Holbein is, being, you know, is revered, and, you know, of course, rightly so, but actually Hans Holbein at court was paid relatively low amounts compared to tapestry weavers. Um, and uh, in, in Henry VIII's inventory uh, from 1547, he had 200 paintings. We had 2,000 tapestries. They were the most valuable thing in his collection, the tapestries, the embroideries. We, we haven't been seeing um, art and decorative arts and visual culture through Tudor eyes mm. for a very long time, and I think that's starting to change. Um, so I often start my talks with, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues will tell you that Tudor art and architecture is the pinnacle of, uh, to, you know, Tudor um, majesty. They're completely wrong. Through Tudor eyes, it's textiles. Um, but equally, you know, we have to, we, so we have to definitely challenge the hierarchies that we understand and try and reframe them. Absolutely. 
Um, so we've mentioned a few of the kind of value judgments that perhaps are clinging on still um, in some areas. So that's obviously one reason behind perhaps the, the overlooking of these genres. But I wonder if there are other aspects to this. You know, I mean, I think there's also been a tendency to assume, as I was saying at the beginning, that these things are not intellectual, they're not interesting in any way other than a sort of antiquarian, it exists, and that's, that's that, you know. Yeah, I just wanted to mention another genre that I think we're discovering mm. a lot more recently, which is uh, the kind of illustrations that we can find in books and in manuscripts of the kind that I was showing, which we perhaps used to think of as primarily textual resources, but we're becoming more and more aware of the pictures in them. Um, there's been a lot of attention to things like emblem books, uh, books of anatomy with their diagrams, all those kinds of things. Um, and I think one reason that we haven't looked at them so much before is just because they weren't very accessible to us, actually, because they would have been in scholarly libraries where you needed to be a professional scholar with a reader's card, or you know, if they were in a manuscript library, they'd be even more inaccessible. But lots of them are available online now, so we're much more able just to you know, have a look at them and get a kind of overall sense of them. And I, I think you know, they've partly been neglected also because of the kind of value judgments that we're talking about, that often they're seen as rather kind of crude, rather sort of basic. But they just give us uh, access to the kinds of images that many more Tudors would have been seeing. You know, if we think about the portraits, how many people would have actually seen them if they were at court or in an aristocratic household, whereas books and perhaps manuscripts too would have circulated rather more widely. Um, and yeah, I mean, they give us a different kind of view of the culture. If I think about Batman, for instance, he writes a book called The Crystal Glass of Christian Reformation. Uh, which has lots of illustrations of people committing different sins or people's personifications of different sins, like covetousness and pride and so on. Uh, and in many of those images, there's a figure of the devil. And he might look rather old-fashioned to us. He looks rather kind of medieval because he's got batty wings and he's got claws instead of feet and he's got horns. Uh, we might not have thought of that as an Elizabethan image, but it is. And it tells us a lot about the persistence of that kind of imagery after the Reformation, on right through to the end of the 16th century and beyond. So we get a rather different kind of angle on the culture if we're looking at these sources that are circulating more widely and that are more kind of in the hands of the middling sort um, and, and, and having a kind of existence in that wider culture. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, there's obviously a tendency among political historians and social historians to call this period the, the early modern period, which already puts a skew in terms of, you know, what what we're thinking about is new, you know, and what heralds something in later centuries. But I think particularly in the arts, we're also looking backwards at, at persisting traditions and guilds and methods of working that can tell us a lot more about um, what the Tudors valued, would you say? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll... So uh, uh, another thing I was thinking about in terms of the, the genres that have opened up to us, the categories, the sort of media that have opened up to us more recently is the question of survival. Um, so I suppose that links with the survival of the medieval tradition into the Tudor period and into the 17th century. And an awful lot more survives than is, is stripped away, actually. Um, the, so the symbolism that we've all been talking about, the kind of absolute mode of understanding artworks which is about thinking about symbolic meaning, that, that's something that's prized and praised in medieval art, but seen as somehow awkwardly didactic or something in Tudor art. It, it, I don't understand why the medieval period is kind of lauded as being, you know, the, anyway. Uh, and then somehow there's a sort of sense of decline that, that is associated, I think, wrongly with the Reformation. Um, but at the same time, we've got that survival and persistence of tradition, but then the sources that are available to us, the artworks that are available to us, are what have been, what survived and there have been all kinds of choices made about what survives, um, partly through recycling, partly through family collections. With my material, very, there are enough examples to suggest that uh, these, this kind of interior decoration, this, these kind of paintings on walls was incredibly ubiquitous, but it was largely destroyed um, uh, through the 17th century, sometimes covered over and uncovered during the Victorian period, where it was noted, as you said, Christina, purely through antiquarian interest, not, not because it was considered something worthy of study, but because Shakespeare might have seen it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's another really interesting kind of aspect of this kind of what survives, how we view what survives, and then the kind of uh, framework that we impose on, on it um, in terms of aesthetic judgment. Yeah, can I just jump in there? Um, because um, 
one of the one of the challenges that textiles um, have is that they don't survive. Um, and you know there there are there are probably a number of cases where that's true. If you think of Hampton Court, so the Hampton Court kitchens, two hundred men worked there daily feeding a quart of hundreds more. And that's a tangible footprint that people can go and see, um, as, is, as is the palace itself. Me, as many women were doing the laundry by the river, um, but that doesn't survive. There's no archaeological footprint for that. So we, that, that's not part of the guidebooks. Um, and equally, textiles were so valuable. It's because they were so valuable, they don't survive. They were reused, they were cut up, they were handed down, they were changed. Their provenance is lost. They must be there somewhere. Um, but uh, because they haven't survived, they're not part of that traditional lexicon. And I think um, one of the things that I'm, you know, as to your first question, actually, one of the things I think we're seeing more and more um, in academia, but also in museums and heritage, is trying to uncover and find those hidden stories. You know, possibly, I think this, you know, this feels like a, a kind of new thing um, uh, but you know it's those hidden stories and perhaps even those invisible stories that I think we're starting to to, to really get to grips with yeah absolutely it's sort of a, 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 maybe something that digital is also helping with us with yeah know, accessibility um, so I wonder then perhaps uh, Helen you might like to speak to this but what can Tudor theories of mind tell us about attitudes towards images and how might that change and we've already talked about the kind of perception of hierarchy being distinct from theirs but are there other thoughts you have on I, I, absolutely I, I think what's fascinating is how different Elizabethan ideas about the mind are from our own I mean, if we're talking about things that are elusive and don't survive you know the mind of course is very elusive to access not only across time but even in your own time and in yourself and um, the Elizabethans were fascinated by the saying nosce te ipsum which means know yourself that's one of their favorite mottos and also their religious outlook, their Protestant faith taught them to kind of look within, to try and explore themselves. But they're very much surrounded by competing and conflicting intellectual frameworks which tell them different things about how they can understand the mind. So on the one hand, they have uh, Aristotle, who says the mind is embodied, it's an organ of the body. They have humoral medicine, which also says that the mind is very much a kind of integral, organic part of the body. But on the other hand, they have frameworks from classical philosophy and from religion which say that the mind is divided from the body, it should be divided from the body, that the mind is purer and higher than the body and it should govern the body, or they're even sometimes enemies to each other, they're hostile to each other. So all of this is kind of in circulation, and I think they're grappling with ways of trying to reconcile these different models. And I think that's one of the reasons why they are so very creative in producing new literary genres like the dramatic soliloquy, the sonnet sequence. These are all ways of trying to look within and express what you find there. And in the visual arts, I think it very much informs their portraiture. Um, there's a fascinating example. I know you're also interested in him. There's um, a musician called Thomas Whitehorn. So he's not one of the aristocrats or royal figures who's having their portrait painted. He's a musician and composer who writes a manuscript autobiography in the 1570s. And one of the things he describes in it is having his portrait painted, which actually he does four times, which is quite unusual for someone of his station, but he does it at different points in his life. And it's because he's so interested in understanding, he says, what I am of mind myself. So I think he's getting his portrait painted for two reasons. One is for that inner understanding, and he understands it as part of a kind of suite of artefacts, including his autobiography and the music he's composing, which all kind of display to an audience what I am of mind myself. But also he's interested in how those four portraits through his life show his mind uh, what, what the, you know, the, the term the Elizabethans would have used is the inward self or the inner man, and he's interested in how that inner man changes over time. So he recounts how he compares a later portrait with an earlier one. He sees how his face has changed. He's got wrinkles on his forehead. His eyes are hollow. But he says, as my face was changed, so were the delights of my mind also. So he's reading inside from outside but the Elizabethans are never quite sure that you can do that. And I think portraits always exist in that elusive space between 
Are they giving, you know, as in the artifact I was talking about, do they give us an image where we can read the mind from the face, or is the mind not legible from the face? You know, Shakespeare gives us contradictory views on this. He has Julius Caesar say of Cassius that he has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. So in that case, you can read the mind from the face. But Hamlet says, I have that within, that passes show. You can't read inside from outside. And all the time, they're in conflict between these different positions, I think. I think that's true. And obviously, I mean, in terms of words, we have what the poets have to go on and it's a drum that I bang quite a lot is that yes the poets want to say no you can't read interiors through surfaces because only the poets have access to those interiors but actually if you look at what the artists are doing they're making a counterclaim and saying actually look I, I can show you the delights of the mind whether it's through uh, an impraiser for example talking about people's philosophy or even something else intangible like your heritage shown through heraldry so there mm. are ways of manifesting these things but we've not really thought about what, what you know whether the painters might have a different opinion about that yes. <laughs> to the poets and, and, and also how a painting a portrait particularly is very often a kind of multimedia image as you say that it's not just a visual image of that person it will have a, an inscription it might have a motto as you say it might have a heraldic crest it's got lots of different ways lots of different readable items and I think what we're all perhaps thinking about in our different artefacts is how text and image work together even the back to an altar cloth it doesn't have text actually on it but but those flowers are kinds of kind of legible aren't they they're not just flowers they mean something and so I think there are lots of different ways in which that inward man that inner self that kind of intention can be conveyed through visual images I, I think it's really interesting the way that changes over the Tudor period so when, uh, you know, at the beginning of the Tudor period, the, the, the Burgundian concept of magnificence, which is, you know, you, the way you dress, for example, it's virtue, you know, if, if you're magnificent, that's virtue made tangible. Mm-hmm. So if you look magnificent, that's because you are magnificent, you deserve, you deserve to be um, at your status. Um, but, but absolutely, that's, that changes. I agree, I'm really interested in that, that idea because in the, the later Elizabethan period where you have all these codes and symbols. You know, as you say, the plants aren't just plants. They, you know, they're, they're stand-ins for knowledge and um, mastery over nature. Uh, you know, and, and each of them has a, a different symbol. That's changed somehow. So we have like, the concept as well of multum in parvo, which is much in little. Um, and and it, it has changed, you're right, yes. from that kind of early uh, Burgundian idea. Um, and you know, even thinking about Elizabeth I herself um, with her poem, you know, Monsieur's, Monsieur's departure. And I'm paraphrasing terribly because I can't remember the words, but I, you know, I love and I dare not show that I love. Mm-hmm. So everything is hidden. Everything is hidden and codified, and it's like a puzzle to unpick. But she still wrote a poem about it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which I always think is, you know, how private was that poem? Why did she, if she did write it, why she wrote it? You know, but who it, was, was it circulated it wasn't to, to? It wasn't to him. So no, exactly. So, yeah, <laughs> so you know, telling other people how it's, sad she Yeah, is. exactly. It's not to the Duke of Alençon. It's for somebody, you know, it's for somebody else. But it, Everything. But it is a, a performance yeah, of privacy, isn't it? Absolutely. Like many portraits yeah. are like that too. They invite mm-hmm. us into a kind of intimacy, yeah. but at the same time they have a mystery. Um, there is this, this, this kind of duality that you're talking about of um, things being in codes which invite interpretation, mm. that draws you in, but something remains elusive, something remains baffling. And I think that reflects, for me, a lot of these kind of conflicts in thinking about the mind and the inner self and whether it's legible or not. Yes, absolutely. Um, wonderful. Uh, Tara, you didn't have anything to... Add on that point. Okay, great. Well, in that case, let's move on to perhaps to thinking about how religious and political and social shifts in this period impact the visual arts. Because I, well, I know that's something you're thinking about, both in terms of religion and in terms of social status. Mm. Um, but I think that has the potential to reveal things to us that were perhaps hidden before as well. Yeah, for sure. So absolutely, the the changes that we can't even begin to imagine the uh, the changes that are taking place um, in the middle of the uh, 16th century and how that radically did alter the visual landscape. Um, But I suppose I've been more interested in continuity than in the the changes. And um, one aspect of continuity is what I've called synoptic images or kind of monoscenic images. So it's the emphasis on storytelling through just a single scene. 
a scene that can encapsulate a whole story through a single dramatic moment. And that's something that, that moves through really seamlessly from the medieval period right the way through the Tudor period. So the examples in my wall paintings are sort of several of these monoscenic scenes that encapsulate the story. But a whole story can be told through just one scene. A good example is Abraham sacrificing Isaac from Genesis 22, where that whole story, um, and it's a long drawn out story that takes up the whole of that chapter, uh, can be told through one single scene of the, the father, Abraham, just about to sacrifice his son, Isaac, at God's command, and he's holding the sword aloft, just about to do the deed, when an angel swoops in, stays his hand, so you get the angel swooping in as well, and it's all sort of this frozen moment. Um, and that scene was incredibly popular right the way through the 16th century. It moves through the Reformation without any issues, because it's an Old Testament scene, but it has incredible uh, spiritual meaning, long-standing spiritual meaning as a, as a type for the sacrifice of Christ. So young Isaac is like an early pre, you know, precursor to Christ. And Abraham's also uh, you know, a symbol of obedience to God. And it's also about the covenant with God. So it's an incredibly rich image, but expressed in th very sim simply through a very simple, dramatic image. And I think that, again, thinking about how um, uh, Tudor people interacted with their images, uh, on one level, it, it's quite, it can appear quite surface, quite superficial, because it's a simple image. But think about all those meanings that are embedded and encoded within it. Um, so in that sense, did the Reformation affect a change in the form and presentation of imagery? Did that kind of monoscenic kind of uh, form, did that allow images to continue to do what they'd always done and to kind of have all of this meaning surrounding it? But at the same time, the other side to the big changes taking place in the 16th century is the opening up of the middling sort where more and more people have disposable income and ability to invest in uh, their belongings and their identity and to show that status to others. And of course, the visual material um, objects are the main way that you, you show that status. So those sorts of images are then appropriated and included on objects that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So not just on the walls of houses, but also on clothing, on nightcaps. So there's, you know, a fantastic description of a nightcap that has Adam and Eve and Abraham and Isaac on it. And so I think here about the performance of religion and the performance of status together, you know, you, you're actually showing your piety and your status at the same time. And this adds up to kind of allow you to, to kind of be accepted into uh, this new class of upper middling sort. Just to just to um, butt in there with what you're describing could also be applicable to today to image making on Instagram <laughs> or on digital on social media because you're you know creating monocenic narratives that you know ca capture so much and that's kind of democratizes image making. Um, and perhaps, and I'm speak, thinking out loud, but perhaps, you know, actually, there's a lot of, from the, from this, from t the Tudor visual arts that's perhaps feeling very relevant to us because so many of, you know, it's something that's so alive in, in popular discourse today. Well, I think particularly the reuse of images. I mean, I know a lot of um, emblem historians who get extremely excited about memes and the parallels between you taking an image that people recognise and that has some currency already in the culture, but then overlaying your own text or uh, images onto it to kind of give it extra meaning. I mean, I think that possibly accounts for perhaps the, the increasing interest in some of these images in Tudor period, which perhaps previously were denigrated as, you know, a bit wonky, a bit weird. Why is there text all over it? That kind of thing. Uh, Helen, you had something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to come in, if I may, just, just to pick up on what Tara was talking about, which was fascinating, I think, about the continuities from medieval to post-Reformation. Because, of course, the one thing that does change is the, the context of those kinds of images of the wall paintings, the bed caps and so on, with, with Old Testament narratives on them, that they can't be in church anymore. They, the, 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 one rule, the one rule is that they must not be in church, which might seem a bit surprising to us, but I think that tells us a lot about how images at the time were informed by their context. The context was so important in terms of how you read, how you responded to an image, whether it was acceptable in that context or not. Uh, one of my other uh, research interests is in images of Elizabeth I, um, both in literature and in the visual arts and um, you know it can often seem to us that portraits of Elizabeth look a little bit like religious icons and it used to be said 
um, by new historicist critics in the 1980s and 1990s that she'd been kind of erected as a sort of substitute for the Virgin Mary, that the English people had a kind of um, psychological void because they couldn't worship the Virgin Mary anymore, so they just put the Virgin Queen in her place. And it obviously can't be as simple as that. You know, people were not stupid. If they'd been told not to be idolatrous, they weren't going to just be idolatrous to another alternative object that looked very similar. And actually, they think about this a lot uh, and, and about what they're doing with these images of Elizabeth. The point of them is that she personifies the English church, the English nation. So she's a strong Protestant image. Um, there's a text from the Old Testament from Isaiah which says that the godly ruler is the nursing mother or father of the church. That gets projected onto her that the true ruler, the true godly ruler will establish and protect the Protestant faith. So she's being, they, they would say she was being represented as God's agent, not being worshipped in her own right. And they come up with this phrase, William Perkins, whom I was um, quoting in my presentation <coughs> on imagination, he wrestles with this a lot, and he comes up with the phrase civil worship, mm. which I think almost to us seems like an oxymoron. But basically, it's okay if it's an image that you're attributing with a certain kind of, you know, you're, you're going to venerate it in some way. It's okay as long as it's in a civil context, not in a religious context, which to us can seem like a sort of contradiction in terms, but that's the Protestant position, which I think we have to try and reconstruct and understand. Yeah, absolutely. I think context is, I mean, we're increasingly paying attention to that, but I think where we might before have expected there to be blanket bans on even things like the image of the crucifixion, actually, it's highly context dependent. Um, I wonder if we could talk briefly about text, because it's come up a few times, the interaction between text and image, and I know it's a common place of uh, Reformation historians to say, oh, well, you know, they put text on these images because they didn't trust them to communicate properly, and there's this proliferation of, of English text on images with the Reformation. But I wonder if that has its origins a little bit before in humanist culture and actually partly the proliferation of English text is, is a reflection of how many more people can read. Mm. Um, I wonder if you have sort of thoughts about text and image relations. Yeah, I mean, I think literacy is obviously still not a, a kind of majority no. faculty that, you know, it's very hard uh, to quantify, to, to measure how many people actually were literate. And there might be differences between reading literacy and writing literacy. More people might have been able to read than could write. So we don't, we don't really know how many people are literate, but it does seem to be growing in the period. And you've got the spread of the grammar school network, which is kind of driving education. I think I would want very much to think in terms of dialogue between text and image, and how they're kind of working together and kind of doing different things in all the artefacts that we've been talking about. Um, the, the Batman image in the manuscript that I was showing people, um, it would be very hard to decipher without the text, but equally the text would make no sense without the image. They have to work together, and I think we, ha we have to... You know, this takes us back to portraits as well and thinking about them as these kind of multimedia artifacts where it's not just the face, it's not just the visual mm. that we should be thinking about. Um, again, you know, can make a comparison from literature where Philip Sidney in his defence of poesy, he says that poesy should be a speaking picture and I think we need to think of pictures as visual texts. There's so much interaction between these media mm. in the period. I mean, even for you, Larry, I think that's true. We think of yeah. text and textile from Texera to weave. Um, writers leaving clues and plots, those are all textile-related words. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, you know, a lot of the source material for the imagery on uh, Tudor textiles, um, it, it's, they're from images in books. And, um, you know, there's no words, but I think it's really important that they're from books. Um, you know, that's, that's certainly something that whoever created these images was really keen to convey. They wanted to show, you know, they've they've done a, they've copied some of these images from books so precisely. It's to demonstrate that they have access to books mm. and access to knowledge and what that all all of that entails. Mm. Yes, Tara. Yes, yeah, so I, at the moment I'm writing something about wall texts in churches. Mm. So you know, the writing on the wall, the writing up of scriptural verses in churches, which was. Uh, uh, encouraged by um, uh, uh, Elizabeth and, and continued throughout uh, the early part of the 17th century. 
And I would just, what I'm trying to do with that, is that when Elizabeth recommended the writing of texts in churches, she, uh, the, 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 the instruction says that this should be for um, uh, edification, but also for comely ornament and demonstration that the place, that the same as a place for prayer. And so I'm trying to shift the emphasis to the comely ornament, the comely decoration bit, because we naturally tend to look at the text and start to try and decipher the text because we are a literate society. I'm trying to suggest that because of my training, because I'm always looking at decorative cartouches and that's what my eye goes to, that that's probably more how the majority of people would have looked and seen and interpreted in this period. So they probably would have looked to the surround first and made a judgment about that before they turned to the text, if they could read the text at all, if you think about the makeup of most parishes. So it's about that, again, trying to move things away. The tyranny of the text has long reigned supreme, and we should now be thinking about how that, that intersection, that, that kind of balance of the visual and the textual operated in the period. Yeah, and, and just thinking that there's an interplay there. I'm thinking of Geoffrey Whitney's Choice of Emblems, mm-hmm. um, which was published in, in 1586, um, the patron's Robert Dudley. And in it is a, a, an image of a symbol and then a little poem about what the symbol means. But, the, but each is, as you know, the, the image is, is, is as important, if not more important, than the text. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that was with the dedication that this would be a puzzle for the virtuous and, uh, you know, conundrum for the unworthy or something <laughs> but, yeah. so if you could say one thing that you think the Tudors valued most about the artworks that you think about what would it be yeah you go and you start <laughs> yeah I, I, I think just building on what we've been saying it's meaning and message it's presenting something that's soliciting interpretation but not offering interpretation easily that mm. has a kind of intricacy and an encodedness an elaboration to it um, that makes you want to unravel it and engage with it. But you've got to work at that. You're being engaged in a very laborious kind of way that you, you, you've got to decode and deconstruct to some extent. That seems to me to be the main characteristic and the main thing that they value, kind of working images, speaking images, if you like. No Netflix, so no. something to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, know. Um, I, can't sum, I can't summarise it in one thing, but... Um, uh, for, for the Tudors, textiles were um, meaningful for, for, you know, they were practical, they were portable, but they also had, they could convey a symbolic narrative mm. you know, through arms and heraldry, but also complex narratives and biblical and classical allusions. But also because they really liked status and hierarchy and they liked to show magnificence and power. Um, and certainly with the sorts of textiles that I'm talking about with royal and elite textiles, it's about the display of power and wealth and majesty. Great. Tara? I'd agree with all of that and add uh, or, or return to my idea of comeliness, which mm. I'm obsessed with at the moment, um, because we think of comeliness in, in relation to kind of being attractive or fair or becoming. Um, uh, but actually, there's a, there are two meanings, and, and one of the m- more often used meanings in the period was to do with um, appropriateness, um, appropriateness of place and position. So you, you would want comely ornament in order to uh, exemplify your status, and that had to be fitting, and everybody knew the language of what was fitting. And if it wasn't fitting, then it's a breach of decorum, and everybody would know, and it would be horrendously embarrassing. So get, being comely is incredibly important. Lovely, thank you. So before we move to questions from the floor, I just have one more question for each of you, which is, what are some of the most exciting directions for the future of Tudor art history? I'm really interested in the way that um, that recent scholarship has started uh, looking outward. Um, I'm really interested in in, in seeing the Tudors on an international Mm -hmm. stage. Ah, yes, a little plug for our our next roundtable, which is globalising the Tudors in a few weeks. Um, Helen. Yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done um, in conversations between literary scholars and those who work on the visual arts and in thinking about the mind. Uh, If I can give a little plug for your work, Christina. So um, Christina's fantastic book, Tudor Liveliness, um, which has just come out. Uh, You're working with the idea from rhetoric of Enargea, which is an idea we're very familiar with in, in literary studies, that uh, rhetoric manuals of the time uh, promoted an argea, which is a vivid description, the vivid evocation of a scene so that you feel like you're present. And uh, Christina's been showing how that's really relevant to lots of 
forms of the visual arts in the Tudor period, but perhaps particularly portraiture, that it's creating this sense of presence and this sense of a kind of exchange of passions, of emotions between the viewer and the sitter in the portrait. And I think there are other terms from rhetoric. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit already today about invention and imitation, which are important terms for the Elizabethans. We could talk about ingenium, which is a Latin term they use to mean a sort of cleverness or wit. And all of this, I think, comes back to... Um, the way that they're not so interested in originality as we are, they have quite different aesthetic principles and they are very interested in, as we've said, things that are very elaborate, very intricate, so that the word artificial for the Elizabethans, we think of that as a pejorative term. It's not pejorative for them. For them, for something to be artificial means it's been made with great artifice, with great um, artful skill, great skill in crafting. And I think we're, you know, we've still got further to go in thinking about these very different aesthetic principles that we need to apply to what they're producing. Absolutely. And I should just say, there is a flyer on your seats for a discount for my book. And if you want it online, then you put Tudor in capital letters into the um, checkout of Yale University Press's website. Um, yeah. I should probably have mentioned that at the beginning. And, Highly recommend uh, <laughs> And Tara, finally. So I think what's most exciting um, is that there's still a lot of material to be discovered. So going back to those, the, that, the fact that we're looking in different places now and that there, there are these rich survivals, but because we haven't been looking in the right places or we haven't been noticing um, uh, other than fine art, means that there's still an awful lot out there waiting to be looked at and reconsidered. And so I think that's the most exciting thing. That Absolutely. There's still so much more to do. There's, yeah, there's so much to say, and I hope that's heartening to any graduate students listening who might be thinking, oh, what could I possibly work on? Well, Tudor art is definitely, there's a lot up for grabs. So um, thank you. One, thank you to the panel. Um, so can we now move to questions from the floor? Does anyone have anything they wanted to ask? Or... I want to mention... Oh, oh, I've got to hand you this microphone. I wanted to mention the great tapestries where... People did it all together, and mm. you know, I feel that's very much part of that period. Mm. Okay. Did anyone want to respond? Just, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I think that tapestries are you know, the, the, the labour and skill that went into tapestries is. Um, the togetherness. Yeah. Huge tapestries. Absolutely. They still survive in wonderful places. I think they're also very interesting for their narrative techniques, aren't they? Mm. Very like the wall paintings that you have that thing of the same characters being seen all in one tapestry in different stages of the narrative, and you have to yes. kind of read it as a, yeah. as a sequence, around. which we're not really familiar with. But yeah, that's a, another part of their I kind of richness, isn't it? That's it. That, one of the things I wanted to say ahead of talking about my wall paintings, which I hope came out in the way that I described them, is that... that we're stuck in this kind of mode of linear viewing. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you look at one scene, you move on to the next, you move on to the next. And, and actually, that kind of set, one of the themes that I think we've all addressed in one way or another is that sense of movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, people viewed on the move, people wore things that were appreciated on the move, but also the, the mode of viewing was actually quite circular. And you would move around an artwork again and again or jump around and rather than kind of moving in that. And tapestries are a fascinating example of that, I think, because they're so vast. So you, you're kind of looking all around and taking, taking and it all in. The togetherness of it. Mm. You know, people did this together. Mm. It was a very strong community. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, yes, I'm interested in the, the pre-Reformation um, art forms, uh, e ecclesiastical I'm talking about. So, for example, um, altar cloths or vestments um, or wall paintings or stained glass, because obviously a huge amount was destroyed. Um, do we know whether there was a sort of continuity of, of, of that style within the ecclesiastical um, style? Or, or was it sort of, you know, they wanted to whitewash effectively everything that was pre-Reformation and start again? Or, or do, can we see a link between what came pre- and post-Reformation? I, th I think there's definitely a disruption. Um, so if you imagine the portraits of Thomas Cranmer, say, and he's in his white and his black, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a sombre appearance to vestments, um, 
And we know that, for example, the Stonyhurst vestments, which were commissioned by Henry VII, were actually um, wrapped up and uh, stolen out of the country by, um, by the Jesuits to take to saint Omer. So they rescued them. Um, the rest were burnt. So we know that vestments with all of the, the iconography and, uh, were either recycled and reused. So a lot of them ended up in, um, you know, Bess of Hardwick's tapestries, the cloths of gold and so on, or they were, you know, they were burnt and, and, and melted down for, for the gold bullion. So there's definitely, a, there's definitely a disruption during the Reformation. But we see it come, we see grand vestments then return in the 17th century. So it's a, it's a fleeting disruption. And in terms of wall decoration, not everything was whitewashed. Uh, the, pro the, the process of reforming churches in the 16th century was actually quite piecemeal and quite selective. Oh. So you would, you would whitewash over the great doom painting over the chancel arch because that has images of, of Christ in majesty. Uh, you would get rid of images of saints and saints' lives, maybe some aspects of Christ's passion. But other imagery, because churches were full, obviously, of all different kinds of narrative series, things like the dance of death could be allowed to remain because there's nothing objectionable in that imagery. Um, somebody worked under Cromwell. Uh, Cromwell did away with everything. So what's really interesting is that a lot of the imagery that was eradicated as a result of Reformation happens in the mid-17th century not under the Tudors. Um, I'm not saying there wasn't huge amounts of destruction and whitewashing, but I think it's been overstated because there was a tolerance and an appreciation for artworks that didn't contravene the, the guidance around idolatry. If it, it, if it could be allowed to remain, then it usually was allowed to remain. And there's a fantastic character called um, um, William Dowsing in the 1640s that takes it upon himself. He's a Puritan. He takes it upon himself to go around and, and kind of re remove... The, the, the remaining offending imagery. And he's, he's kind of the one that gets rid of every last sort of uh, element of the Tudor rich heritage of the kind of uh, late medieval and in, Tudor period. Interestingly, just to jump in there, that um, Oliver Cromwell retained the Abraham tapestries at Hampton Court um, because they were, they, he, they, they, he was happy to have them reflect his you know, status within the palace. Mm -hmm. And yet he upsets me more than really anybody. <laughs> I mean, I think Keith Thomas has the line that the Victorians were worse for medieval art than any yeah. of the reform reforming movements before that. Yes. Um, any further questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Some online. <laughs> so this is a question online from anonymous attendee. Um, so this is for Helen. How do ideas of imagination impact on early modern ideas about madness and distraction? Yeah, they're really closely linked. So um, the imagination was thought to be particularly active in people who were suffering from melancholy. And melancholy uh, wasn't just uh, a kind of state of gloominess or uh, sadness, as we might uh, think of it now. It was that, but it also came along with a whole range of... Um, Symptoms, and it was thought of as rooted in the body because through the whole kind of scheme of humoral medicine, uh, melancholy was one of the uh, fluids known as the humours that circulated in the body. It was thought to originate in a substance called black bile. And if you had too much of it, if you had an excess of it, you would be uh, afflicted with, alan with melancholy. Your whole kind of system would sort of get out of balance. And one of the things this would do is kind of inflame your imagination. Um, and so you would have particularly active and fearful dreams. Um, you could be very creative. Some melancholics were thought of as having enhanced intellectual powers and being very creative and being great thinkers. But at the same time, you'd be very much afflicted by your kind of fear and, and uh, suspicion and wanting to be on your own all the time, perhaps suicidal thoughts, seeking out darkness, seeking out solitude. I'm sure you're all kind of recognising Hamlet from this. Hamlet is a textbook melancholic. So melancholy and madness are very much linked um, in this period. Uh, quite how we can relate that to the visual arts, um, we can certainly think of lots of representations of melancholics because it also, through its association with high intellect, with creativity, it becomes an aspirational identity. So we get various uh, aristocrats wanting to be depicted as melancholics. We get portraits, for instance, of Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, dressed all in black, lying down under a tree, uh, with his head propped on his arm, being a kind of textbook 
melancholic, not mad. So yeah, there, there, you know, there, there are some versions of melancholy where it gets more towards a kind of madness, other where it's, where it's a more controlled sort of state of uh, reflectiveness and contemplation. But yes, there's certainly a connection there between melancholy and the overactive imagination. Brilliant, thank you. And then um, we've had a couple of questions for you, Larry, so I'm just going to kind of package them all together about conservation. So someone has asked um, if a cloth of silver, would it, would it tarnish unlike gold and then how and how often has the altar fabric been cleaned um so so metal thread does tarnish um and so when it is preserved that's just through that's just a you know through happen chance and good good circumstance so um silver and gold will tarnish through oxidization so with con contact with the air so you can imagine that most metal threads after this amount of time have tarnished um, so the fact that the, the Bacton altar cloth must have been kept in a in a in a chest or some kind of enclosed uh, place to have the thread still so vibrant after so many hundreds of years. If you go to see the Abraham tapestries at Hampton Court, they've been exposed to the air to you know for hundreds of years, and they're grey and they're dull. And so actually, when you go and you see them, and they you know they're grey and they're dull and they look a bit beige actually all of that dullness would have would have been silver and gold and it would have glimmered um so it's just luck that preserves it unless you can get oxygen out of the air um and then the other question was how many times has it been cleaned and how so i can't speak for before it got to Hampton Court. We know that they did some conservation on it in 1909, so the parishioners, probably the ladies of the parish, got together and, and, and did some rudimentary conservation on it. Um, I don't know if they cleaned it at that point. Um, I doubt it because the silks and the dyes would have run, so it's been in very good, it's in very good nick, really. Um, the, the textile conservators at Hampton Court Palace um, cleaned it with cosmetic sponges. So the same sponges that you apply makeup with, they actually dabbed it very, very gently. It took weeks, months of time to do it, and that lifted off some surface dirt. Not all of it, because to, to clean it or to wash it in any way would be very, very risky. So that's one of the amazing things about seeing the colour on the back, which has been away from the light and away from dirt and seeing them vibrant and, and you know, it was quite something great and then there was another question for helen um is there a possible connection between batman's drawing and drama in general with regards to the imagination this is referring to thesis's comments at the end of mnd midsummer night's dream oh, yes. yeah <laughs> that's yes. the one yeah, so for anyone who's not, um, hasn't recently seen or read A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, in Act 5, after everyone's had their kind of crazy night in the woods, Theseus makes a speech about what he calls shaping fantasies. It's a speech all about the imagination. And he starts out meaning to disparage the imagination, to take the conventional Elizabethan line, which I described, which is that imagination um, is unreliable, it's fantasy, it creates images out of its own workings, they're deceptive, they'll uh, lead you astray. So he talks about how the lunatic, the lover and the poet are of imagination or compact. But as that speech goes on, he kind of undoes himself because it ends up sounding like a celebration of the imagination. Uh, he says, as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. I always get slight shivers when I speak those lines because I think there's no more brilliant description of the poetic imagination. I think that's Shakespeare really kind of reveling in his sense of his own imagination. That's very new in the period. That sense of the imagination as a wonderful creative power to celebrate is something that we rarely find and that, that Shakespeare's really been very innovative um, in putting forward in that way. Uh, yeah, so I think what Theseus is setting out to say is very much in tune with the Batman drawing, which is showing imagination as treasonous, as being associated with religious and political subversion, as being a kind of disorder in the mind, which is related to disorder in the state. And that's something that you know, I haven't talked about so much today, but I'm very interested in um, 
what I call in my book the politics of the mind, the way that the mind was thought of as almost like a commonwealth, like a state or nation that had to be ruled hierarchically with reason governing, governing imagination and governing the passions. I think Batman very much subscribed to that. Um, Shakespeare makes Theseus start off. Theseus, of course, a great kind of patriarchal authority figure, the Duke of Athens, the, the, the Athens being the kind of seat of reason. Theseus starts off trying to espouse that kind of politics of the mind, which is very hierarchical and rigid and top-down. But through the course of his speech, we can sort of hear Shakespeare speaking through him and celebrating the imagination instead. Have we got time for one more? Okay, so... Um, one more, I think, sorry, we, this isn't particularly specific. Um, it was brought up in the discussion. Does anyone know the name of the composer who was mentioned as having written his autobiography yes. and had several portraits painted? That was Thomas Whitehorn. And it's spelt different ways, but usually it's spelt W-H-Y-T-H-O-R-N-E, Thomas Whitehorn. And he wrote an autobiography um, only in manuscript in its own time, there are two modern editions of it from the 1960s, both by the same editor. I think it's James M. Osborne. And one of them is in Whitehorn's original spelling, which is really eccentric. He came up with his own phonetic spelling system. And the other one is in modern spelling, which is a lot easier to read. So you'd have to go to a library to get access to them, but they're well worth a look. They're really fascinating. Thank you. That's all right, Rachel. Um, fantastic. I think unless there are any other burning questions in the room or online, I think it might be time to move to drinks. Sadly, not for the people online. Well, you may be able to move to drinks. But, um, if the people in the room would like to join us next door for uh, drinks and can, please. Um, and I'd just like to thank, again, my fantastic panel. Um, I think we've really um, raised some exciting questions for the future of Tudor art history. Thank you. Thank you.